All right, hello everybody and welcome. Thanks for joining the Audubon Center of Riverlands today for this virtual presentation. So you're with myself, Emily Connor. I'm an educator at the center, as well as my coworker, Michelle Wiegan. She's our education manager. And so today we're gonna to be exploring nesting at Riverlands and diving into the types of birds that we get to see, as well as the monitoring efforts that we have. So as you may know, spring is here and that means it's a nesting season. So right about now is prime time for birds to be nesting and perhaps you've seen a few in your own neighborhood. So birds and their nests can come in so many different shapes and sizes and they can also use so many different types of materials and that's what makes birds such a cool animal. Um, and so let's look at some different examples of these nests. So perhaps you have a cup-shaped nest in a tree. Or maybe you're using mud to build your nest and it's on the side of a cliff. So here you can see that cliff swallow peeking his head out of his nest. Or you're nesting on the ground. Perhaps you're nesting up in a tree with very large sticks and lots of them or at the very top of the tree, skinnier sticks, not as much. All right, so now we're gonna kind of dive into some of the things that are happening out at Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary at this time related to nesting birds. So we're first gonna highlight a couple of birds that are nesting out at the sanctuary right now and then we're gonna also talk to you about some of the nesting projects that Audubon and our partners are participating in. So the first bird we're gonna highlight is the Baltimore Oriole, um, which is a beautiful bird, bright orange, um, and they're in our region at this time. And they've got a really unusual nest um, that's often described as looking like a bag or a sock hanging from a tree. Um, and they actually weave that nest out of natural materials that they find. Um, so they'll use plant fibers like down from dandelions um, and other materials and actually weave those fibers together. Um, so you can see here the Baltimore Oriole, it's a female. She's actually taking her beak and weaving those fibers into a nest. Um, they have some favorite trees to nest in and out where we work at the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary, we have a ton of cottonwood trees, which is one of their favorite trees to nest in. And cottonwood trees can become huge, huge trees. And so when you're looking up at, at one of those cottonwood trees, um, as you can see when those leaves come in, these nests can be really hidden um, and be well camouflaged amongst those tree leaves. And so when you're looking at those massive cottonwood trees, these nests can be really hard to spot. Um, so they're very, very good builders, good architects, and very smart about where they place their nests as well. So another favorite bird that's nesting out at Riverlands right now is the killdeer. Killdeer, um, they're a small shorebird and they actually nest right on the ground. So if you can see in this picture, this killdeer is actually sitting on top of a nest. Um, you can see a couple of eggs underneath them. Um, and what they'll do is they'll uh, take a collection of rocks um, or they'll just nest right on the, the ground. And they have these really unique um, eggs that are kind of beige colored with a lot of black and brown speckles. Um, but because they nest on the ground, they can be really vulnerable to predators. But they have created this, um, developed this really special behavioral adaptation that helps them to actually deter predators. So we're going to share a short video of what it might look like if you were to happen upon a killdeer nest yourself. They will try to make a lot of noise and move around to try to get you to actually go after the adult bird and kind of go away from the nest. So what they'll do is they'll actually 
make a lot of noise, and then they pretend that their wing is broken, and they'll run away from the nest, which is trying to lure the predator toward that adult bird and away from the nest. So let's, let's watch and see what that looks like. Killdeer actually did pretend that its wing was injured. It went away from the nest and tried to lure what it thought was a predator toward it. Um, so pretty cool adaptation that those killdeer have. So if you're ever in an area like on a gravel road um, or out at a park and you see a bird making that kind of ruckus, um, it might mean that you are near its nest. So do look around at your feet and just be careful where you're stepping. So All right, thanks Michelle. Um, so now let's dive into what nesting projects we actually have going on on the sanctuary now that we learned about two really cool birds that we do find there. So one of my favorite ones to talk about is our least tern, and this is a really special summer visitor that we receive. Um, and they are actually the smallest of all terns. So they really are, they look like a miniature gull almost with a little bit different design, a little more slender. Um, and so least terns, they will typically nest on sandy or gravelly kind of uh, beaches or sandbars that you probably find along lakes or rivers. And for their nesting, it's really just a very small, shallow depression in the ground. So if you take a look at this photo here, we have this cute little uh, turn and looking up at his parent, and you can actually see one of the eggs right behind him. And that is their nest. So it's directly on the ground. You can see there's lots of sand and shell material here. So again, it's a very small kind of depression, an unusual nest from what we're typically used to seeing. Um, but those chicks are just so adorable. I love to see them. Um, and typically you can find them at the sanctuary between late April and through September. Um, so late spring all the way through summer to the beginning of fall. Now, personally, I haven't seen uh, any lease turns yet on the sanctuary, um, but they could be arriving any day now. So we're really excited about that. Now, unfortunately, their population has a little bit of a concern. So in the 1900s, their population drastically declined. In fact, they were actually listed as an endangered species in uh, 1985. So let's find out kind of why they're facing some issues with their populations. So because of the Mississippi River, um, you know, if we look through history a while ago, it used to be very shallow. Um, and so if you look at the picture on the left here, this is kind of uh, what the Missouri, the Mississippi River used to look like. And so because it was very shallow and wide, there were lots of opportunities for sandbars to form and shorelines. And this was really great habitat for these terns when they were nesting. However, around the 1900s, um, people were starting to have more of a need for navigation. And whether that be just for traveling uh, around the Midwest or exporting of goods. Um, so it was important for our economy. And so the Mississippi River now looks more like the photo on the right here. And so right now the Mississippi River is maintaining a nine foot deep channel. And this really allows super large barges and large ships to be able to travel up and down the river um, so they can export goods and, and things like this. But there's a problem with this new photo, right? With a deeper river, um, there's less opportunities for those sand barges, and the sandbars, um, and so that means there's less habitat for at least terns when they're nesting. And so this is a big kind of issue today. And so because of this, the Army Corps of Engineers on the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary have worked really hard to come up with a solution. 
Um, and so to mitigate all that habitat loss and um, the loss of those sandbars that were really important for our terns, the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary in 2010 created our interior lease tern barge project. So if you look at the bottom left photo, this is a picture of our barge. So really it's just a floating kind of platform in the water. Um, and you can actually see this barge right when you enter the sanctuary and it's in Teal Pond. So right when you turn in, it's one of the first things that you get to see. And so um, with this barge, uh, every summer the Corps will cover it in sand and uh, kind of different materials, pieces of wood, and this is kind of just providing more structures to uh, give the terns more protection, um, but also giving them nesting materials. As you look in the bottom left photo here, you can also see that there's a gate kind of surrounding the barge. And this was fortified to prevent uh, predation, to keep other predators out. Um, and so that's been pretty effective. So basically, these terns are getting private beaches, and the best part about it is that they're working. And so this past nesting season, so in 2019, we had so many successes, one of our most successful years. In fact, we had around 47 nests on that small barge there. Um, and among those, we had 74 eggs. Um, around more than 60 chicks were observed throughout the whole season, and 46 of them were banded. And so what really made last uh, nesting season such a success is the fact that we got to see this turn that you can see in the center bottom here. And so if you look at the zoomed in photo, you can actually see a tag around his foot. And so this was the first sighting of a previously banded least turn chick that has returned years later uh, as an adult that is now nesting on the barge. So this is a huge success and it suggests to us and the Army Corps, that the terns are starting to kind of turn to this artificial nesting habitat um, in an effective way. So um, one of our newest monitoring pro projects that just started this year is for our American kestrels. And so the American kestrel is our smallest falcon in, the, in North America. Um, unfortunately, their populations as a whole have declined in the U.S. And in fact, over the past 50 years, it has decreased by half, which is a lot. Um, on, so unfortunately, a lot of the reasons for this decline in their populations is mostly unknown. So a lot more research is needed. So our American kestrels, they are cavity nesters, um, which means they're nesting in, um, in some type, form of a cavity. Um, and so they often prefer habitat like pastures or agricultural fields and even short grass prairies. And this really is what makes Riverland such an ideal place to monitor our kestrels um, because of the abundance of habitat that we have. And for that reason, we often get to see these beautiful kestrels year round. So monitoring these can be super helpful and have a, give us a better understanding of American kestrel's population trends in our region, specifically in St. Louis, as we don't have a lot of that data right now. And so with this data, we can better understand why are their numbers declining and what can we do to stop those declines? And so thanks to our partners, St. Louis Audubon Society, the Army Corps of Engineers, World Bird Sanctuary and Amron, we were able to do, install 10 kestrel boxes on our sanctuary in 2020. And so in this photo, you can see Tara Holman, she's our conservation science associate. And so she went out around the sanctuary and actually installed these kestrel boxes. And so we've had a lot of success already. And so if you take a look at this photo here, we had our first nesting pair of kestrels already um, in 2020. And so you can see the adult kestrel inside that box there. Um, and then you can also see the eggs. So they have four eggs coming, um, four kestrel trick, chicks. That's great to contribute to the population. So it's something that we're really excited about. All right, and so one of the final monitoring projects that I'll mention to you guys today is our Eastern Bluebird. Um, this also happens to be Missouri's state bird. So go Missouri. Um, unfortunately, Eastern uh, Bluebird populations have reached record lows in the 1960s. And so this bird um, during that time really lost a lot of its habitat 
um, where forests were cut down um, for farming or just developing residential areas. So this habitat loss had a big impact. And so these birds are secondary cavity nesters. And so since their beak and their feet aren't quite as strong, they don't really have the ability to dig out their own nesting holes. And so they really do rely on finding pre-existing cavities for their nesting. And so they might find that from uh, a pre-existing cavity nest from, let's say, a large woodpecker that created that cavity in a tree. Um, but what's really interesting about the eastern bluebird is that they've transitioned from relying on those natural cavities to man-made cavities like our bluebird box that you can see in the photo here. And so because these secondary nesters are really relying on these boxes, um, this just further shows how important uh, nest, nest box monitoring is. And if we do monitor these changes to the bluebird population, we have a better understanding of what types of things are impacting the species. And so what's happening on the sanctuary right now with this? This year we've also had more successes. And so we even we have eight bluebird boxes on the sanctuary. And among those eight, we've had three complete nests being built. And our conservation science associate actually just went on the sanctuary uh, two days ago and took this photo here. So we do have two bluebird eggs in one of those nests. So we do have a nesting pair. That's great uh, news to hear. Um, and then with this, all this data that we're collecting, we can also enter this into the Nest Watch program. So we're contributing the data from this to, uh, globally. And so other people can use this information to learn more about our bluebirds. And so what we're gonna do next is we're actually gonna cut to Tara Homan, our conservation science associate, and she is going to give us a sneak peek of what it's like to be um, in the science field, uh, working at the Audubon Center of Riverlands, and kind of what monitoring looks like on the sanctuary right now. Having these nest boxes up for bluebirds and kestrels is really important, especially since both bluebirds and kestrels are cavity nesters. That's why we have these cute little boxes. And a lot of the natural cavities that you would find out in the wild are either overcompeted for because there's a lot of birds looking to use cavities just because there really aren't that many left. And so providing these boxes gives these birds another way to produce, breed, and boost their population. I'm Tara Homan and I'm the Conservation Science Associate here at the Audubon Center at Riverlands. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go about monitoring our two nest boxes that we have here out on the Riverlands Sanctuary. One of them being bluebird boxes and the other one being our American kestrel boxes. So in checking our bluebird boxes, what we try to do is come in from one point off of the trail slowly walk up to the box quietly before we open it sometimes i'll knock just in case there's any adult inside um, open it up look inside and what we're looking for here is of course who built the nest so what's the nesting material if we didn't see a bird in the area or come out of the box what's the makeup of the nest are there any eggs are there any chicks if an adult is around what behavior is it displaying? Is it staying around? Is it yelling at us? Is it staying in the box while we're checking? All of this is important in trying to figure out where they are in that breeding cycle. Once we have that information, we'll close the box, walk away, and leave it be. And we do this twice a week, especially when breeding picks up, just so that we have that constant go of how they're progressing since birds do grow up so quickly. I'm going to show you how we go about checking our American kestrel boxes. So if you can see it behind us, we have one of our boxes here, um, all of which, or the majority, are fixed to these utility poles. So what we end up doing is we walk up to it quietly with our big endoscope here fixed to a pole, and we will place the camera inside the box, take a video or a photo of the progress inside, and then report that later to our online database. 
Again, we're looking for who's using the box. Is there any activity from a Kestrel? Any activity from non-natives like starlings who also use these boxes? And then again, count if there's any chicks, any eggs, if, if anything's changed since the last time we checked. Again, we'll report all of this into our designated databases. And then we'll have a good idea of how breeding birds are doing at Riverlands. If anyone at home wants to start their own bluebird box um, trail, whether you have a large piece of property or if you just want to set up one, I highly recommend going online and looking up information um, from the North American Bluebird Society. They have lots of great information on putting up boxes for bluebirds, how to construct them, where you can buy them. And if you want to go as far as to monitor them, like we do here, there's a lot of other places that you can get great information to know the proper way to do that, like Nest Watch, um, which is a Cornell program. Providing these boxes gives these birds another way to produce, breed, and boost their populations. This especially was the case with the bluebirds. Um, their population was really low, really dwindling because of the lack of natural cavities. And once bluebird boxes and that whole project kind of spanned, off, spanned out across North America, those populations rebounded just because they actually had places to nest. So providing boxes like this really helped these species out. All right, with that, I want to thank uh, Tara and Zach for putting that video together, but also to thank you guys for joining us today, for joining the Audubon Center and learning more about what we have going on in our sanctuary in terms of the monitoring projects that we do in our field of conservation, but also just some nesting birds that we have. So we hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, learn more um, and we really want to invite you guys to come out and visit the sanctuary. So um, our sanctuary is open sunrise to sunset. We have over eight miles of hiking trails so it's a great place to come out on a weekend with your family and, and hopefully you could view some of these birds actually out in nature. Hi everyone, thank you.